everybody. Thank you very much for that super welcome. So as Hamish very kindly introduced me, as I'm going to talk to you today about fraud and misconduct in biological sciences. So, fraud and misconduct aren't new. They've been going on for a long time. For example, in the 1970s, there was a chap named William Summerlin. He said that he was going to transplant the skin from black mice onto white mice. And instead, he just coloured in the, black, the white mice with a black marker pen. <laughs> Not very good science. This, the subject I'm going to talk to you about today and why it's called the acid test for biological sciences is something called STAP cells, S-T-A-P, STAP cells. And STAP cells were cells that uh, we were told about in January 2014. And these cells would um, apparently be able to come from anywhere in the body and we'll be able to transfer them into stem cells, okay? Stem cells. And all we'd have to do is a very simple procedure such as dipping them in acid. But it turns out that this wasn't right, this wasn't correct. It was fraudulent and that's what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to examine it in two ways. We're going to talk about it by a replication, so carrying out multiple copies of the same experiment and through trust as well, the trust either between scientists or between public and the science. So, as I mentioned, fraud isn't something new, and lots of people have done um, studies on fraud as well. For example, Ferric Fang produced these nice stats that we've got here in front of us, and between 1973 and 2012, there were 2,047 articles published in the biomedical sciences that were retracted. 43% of these were retracted because of either fraud or suspected fraud. So in 2016, we after the stap cell saga had come about, we thought it was important to have a look at how this was affecting stem cell science in particular. So we did a bit more number crunching. And this is what Ferric Fang came out with for this second study. Between 1989 and 2016, there were 3,244 uh, stem cell articles retracted. That's around two and a half times more than we would expect for biological sciences as a whole. 51% were retracted because of either fraud or suspected fraud. So perhaps there is a little bit more fraud going on in, bio, uh, in uh, stem cell science than in biomedical science, perhaps. As, the, as public, though, we are more aware of fraud in stem cell science. Stem cell science is really exciting, really interesting, it's new, it's cutting edge, and the media like to tell us about it. When we have the drama of fraud mixed into that, we get even more excited about it and the media jump on it. So we're far more aware of stem cell fraud. So this is the article I wanted to talk to you about today. These are STAP cells, S-T-A-P, STAP cells. And STAP stands for Stimulus Triggered Acquisition of Pluripotency. What on earth does that mean? Well, it means that we can take cells from anywhere in the body and apply a stimulus. For example, exposure to a strong acid, and this would cause the cells to revert back to a stem cell-like state. And what this means is that these cells can then produce any other cell in the body. That's what the pluripotency means. So that's what we have. We have cells from anywhere in the body becoming stem cells through a very quick, very simple, very efficient technique. And this was the paper that was published on it. This work was carried out in Japan at an institute called the Riken Institute. And this is our lead author. This is Haruku Obakakita. She became, as I've said on the slide there, an overnight celebrity. Why? Well, first and foremost, she wasn't your stereotypical middle-aged male scientist. She was something fresh and something new. She liked to wear her traditional Japanese overgarments in the lab instead of her lab coat, which you can see on the image there. She was hounded by the paparazzi when this work came out. The clothes that she wore at the press conferences sold out across Japan because people wanted to be like her. Truly an overnight celebrity based on this work that she published. So let's have a look at exactly what happened to STAP cells then. Initially, the reaction from the scientific community was great excitement. 
Why? Well, all of a sudden we had the ability to produce stem cells in the lab from any other cell very quickly, very easily, and very efficiently. Why was this important? Well, there were two other um, options that were available to scientists who wanted stem cells capable of doing this work. The first are embryonic stem cells. Very difficult to use. We're talking um, with regards to ethics, with regards to morals, and legally as well. In fact, in some countries, you can't use embryonic stem cells at all. So it completely blocked that line of research. The second option would be to use induced pluripotent stem cells. Again, these were developed in Japan in the early 2000s. And in 2012, Shinya Yamanaka, who is one of the developers of induced pluripotent stem cells, won the Nobel Prize. And what this meant was, with, again, we could take cells from anywhere in the body, tweak their genetics so that they would start using genes that they hadn't used since they were stem cells, put those back into action, and again, they would start becoming stem cells. But the process was inefficient, it was technically difficult, and it was long-winded. At the moment, it wasn't really an option for other labs to use. This is why people were so excited about stem cells. Great for developmental biologists, they had a reason to say that environment affected uh, our development, as well as genetics. And uh, for medicine as well, imagine being able to take um, a sample from anywhere in the body of someone, turning the, that sample into stem cells and then regrowing it into another organ, skin or liver, for example. Really exciting. But a few weeks later, we started to have some problems with these publications. First and foremost, we start to see that um, people were ex saying that the, some of the images used weren't quite right. We had two images, for example, that should have come from two separate experiments, but it was in fact the same image. The opposite also occurred, where in fact we had images where the, it was supposed to be from two separate experiments put together to make it look as though it was from one. So we had some image manipulation problems there. Later on, we start to have more problems where people are trying to replicate the work. Well, people are trying to replicate it because it is so exciting. They want to use these stem cells in their lab, but they couldn't do it. And in the few weeks following uh, the publication of the article, the, one of the original authors tried to replicate this work in a different lab, and he just couldn't do it. He couldn't get the experiment to work. Again, another few weeks later, and the, some genetic tests were carried out to see whether um, the stap cells that Ober Carter said she produced were actually stap cells, and it turns out that they weren't. It looks as though they were already stem cells. This isn't looking good. This isn't looking good now. So. Whereas uh, originally people started to try and replicate this study because they wanted to use this as a tool in the lab, now they were having to use it as a challenge. They wanted to see whether stap cells were real or not. Obercarter finally uh, agreed to retract the papers. This was after people had accused her of plagiarism in her previous work and other manipulation problems in her previous work. So the papers were retracted in the summer. And by this time, more than 20 different laboratories had tried to replicate the results unsuccessfully. So the question is, was Obercarter guilty of fraud or misconduct? Well, let's have a look at both replication and trust and see whether she was or not. So here's trust. Definition there for us to focus on so we know what we're talking about. There are two main uh, issues of trust that we have at the moment, and that's science, uh, sorry, trust within science and trust external to science. So in science, we have informal and formal measures of trust, where scientists would talk to each other informally in the coffee room, for example, talk about experiments they were thinking of doing or some hypothesis that they were planning on testing. And they would expect other researchers not to pinch those ideas and go and do them first. There's also the peer review process, for example, which is a more formal method of trust. 
where researchers are sent, for example, funding applications, and again, aren't expected to run off with those ideas and go and do them themselves. Or they're expected to give honest critique and feedback. They're not expected to sabotage someone else's work in this peer review process. So that's trust. Replication. Replication is seen as the cornerstone of scientific research. In theory, it is one of the most important things you can do in experiments. Repeat your experiments to see if you get the same results. It's very important for confidence in your results, important for reliability, important to demonstrate quality, for example. And pretty much every single researcher on the planet would agree that replication was important. However, in practice, not so simple. And there are four reasons for this. Firstly, if you look at any scientific paper, the method section is really quite short in comparison to the rest of the paper. It's not detailed. There's no nuance on there. And that makes anyone trying to copy this uh, method, uh, or sorry, leaves anybody with trying to, co to copy this method in some difficulty because they don't know exactly these fine details and nuances. The second problem is that the resources might not be available. For example, if you were testing a drug, you would perhaps test it on a very specific group of patients. That type of patient might not be available anymore, so you can't replicate the test. Furthermore, another problem is um, that there might not be funding available. So lack of resources, again. No scientists to do it because you can't pay them, no money to pay for the equipment, so on and so forth. This brings us on to the third problem with replication, and that's that there is no motivation from scientists. Why aren't, why aren't the scientists motivated? Well, because they can't get replication studies published, and they can't get funding for them. Funders do not want to pay for research that has already been done elsewhere. Publications do not want to publish research that has already been done elsewhere. Everything has to be new and original and exciting and cutting edge. There is no place for replication. The fourth reason, the last reason why replication uh, falls down in science in practical reality is that it can be seen as a challenge to other scientists. It can be seen as a challenge to another uh, scientist's replicate uh, other scientists' integrity and skill. We don't want to do that. It's going to cause great animosity between scientists, between labs, even between countries. And it really isn't where we want to go with science. We don't want to create any animosity in that respect. So let's have a look at trust and replication, in, specifically in the stap cell controversy. First of all, the co-authors of the paper would have had trust in the lead author. They would have carried out their experiments and they would have had trusted the lead author with their results. They trusted her not to misinterpret them or to misrepresent them in the publications. Likewise, the lead author would have expected that all of her collaborators were carrying out the results, uh, carrying out the experiments they said they were going to do and give her those results. There are also the same peer review trust issues that I mentioned earlier. So trust that nobody else was going to try and sabotage, for example, the publication of this work because they were doing something similar. What about replication then? Well, initially, as I mentioned, the replication studies started to be carried out because people wanted to use this method in their labs. They saw it as really important and exciting and a great tool. But as time went on and we started to lose trust in the lead researcher, we started to use replication as a challenge. Had the author actually carried out the experiment she said she had? Well, let's try and replicate it and see if we get the same results. So, the question remains then. Was Obercarter a victim of trust and replication in science? And if she was, if she was, is this a problem? Is this a bad thing? Hopefully what I've managed to establish here today is that trust in science acts independently 
of replication. Trust always has to be there. Trust between sciences, between sciences and the public, all has to be there. Replication, though, in some ways depends on trust. So what happens with replication is we only tend to carry it out if we want to use the same tools in the lab or we carry it out as a challenge to another scientist's integrity and skill, signaling that we don't trust them. So perhaps then we need to think about this as whether there is too much trust in science and not enough replication. Thank you very much.